Welcome to Business Television Africa. This is Business Stories and we bring to you business stories in, around and across the African continent. My name is Anna Maria Nyame. <music> Making headlines, Ghana Maritime Authority has opened a three-day seminar in Accra to raise awareness on safety of navigation systems and vessel systems. Wildlife Division of Forestry Commission of Ghana is seeking to raise $10 million in concessionary investment to uplift the image of Shy Hill Reserve Center as a tourist destination. Chairman of Nigeria's Trust Corp, Tony Ilumu, shares his thoughts on acquisition in Nigeria's energy sector and what needs to be done to attract investors to Africa. Two oil terminals have reopened after rebels agreed partially to lift their oil blockade in a deal reached with government. Going in depth, the Ghana Maritime Authority in collaboration with the Ministry of Transport has opened a three-day seminar in Accra to raise awareness on safety of navigation systems and vessel systems. Minister of Transport Jifa Ativo says the only way to improve navigation on movement of shipping is to create ship routing and vessel traffic services to reduce the incidence of head-on encounters and to reduce the dangers of collision between crossing traffic. The recent discovery of offshore oil and gas in the western part of Ghana's continental shelf in commercial quantities has been welcomed by all sections of the Ghanaian and international community. There is a great deal of expectation among Ghanaians that this discovery and the resulting commencement of exploitation from the fourth quarter of 2010 will bring along significant economic benefits to Ghana. At the same time, however, offshore oil and gas exploitation and development come with enormous responsibilities and challenges. One of the most critical issues is how Ghana is going to manage the many security, safety and environmental issues that will arise over the next decade. It is in light of this that the International Maritime Organization and the Ghana Maritime Authority, GMA, are organizing a three-day seminar to raise awareness on ships, routing system and vessel traffic services. Director General of the Ghana Maritime Authority, Peter Isaka Azuma, stated the objective of the seminar. The seminar is being attended by representatives from eight countries of the West, Africa, West and Central African sub-region. These are Kevede, the Gambia, Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, Liberia, Satomi, Prince and Principe, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. The objective of the seminar, having been elaborated, but just permit me to say briefly to that, is to enable participants to acquire the requisite knowledge and skills on ship routine services, aid navigation, and use of risk assessment techniques for ship routing and navigation channels within our sub-region. Minister of Transport Jifa Ativo in a keynote address indicated that ships routing systems have been established in major congested shipping areas all over the world and that there is overwhelming evidence that as a result of these schemes the number of maritime casualties particularly collisions involving ships have dramatically reduced. Ships routing systems have been established in major congested shipping areas all over the world and there is overwhelming evidence that as a result of these schemes the number of maritime casualties particularly collisions involving ships have been dramatically reduced. The transport minister said this has become necessary as a result of the increase in trading activities particularly as a result of the offshore oil and gas exploration and production taking place within the sub-region. Ghana has already taken steps in establishing a Vessel Traffic Management Information System, VTMIS, for enhanced surveillance of Ghana's maritime domain. This will provide a 24-hour electronic surveillance and monitoring of Ghana's coastline. 
The Shy Hills Reserve Center, located north of Accra, is expected to become an enhanced tourist attraction as the Wildlife Division of the Forestry Commission seeks to raise $10 million in concessionary investment with investor community. The popular ecological reserve, which stands as a habitat to wildlife, will be converted into an international standard tourist attraction when funding is made available. Charles Aite spoke with the executive director of the Wildlife Department, Nana Edu Insia. Tourism continues to be a substantial contributor of foreign earnings into the country. Unfortunately, domestic tourism has largely been on the decline as a great deal of foreigners continue to explore tourist opportunities countrywide. The Wildlife Division of the Forestry Commission says it will require a $10 million fund allocation by way of private partnership investments to revamp the Shah Hills a lush of green vegetation into a lucrative eco-tourist location. The partnership will see qualified investors, both locally and internationally, register interest in the preservation and tourist transformation of the hills and other potential tourist sites across Ghana. Most of Ghana's forest reserves are said to be at risk of fading away with the illegal encroaching of lands by squatters and illegal chainsaw operators, as well as the persistent effect of climate change, the Shah Hills Resource Reserve north of Accra, bordering the Akosumba Road, will go into extinction if measures are not put in place to the once eco-tourist site. Nana Edu Nsia, Executive Director of the Wildlife Division of the Forest Commission, reveals to BTA News the $10 million private partnership investment stands as a lucrative venture to the country's tourist sites. It is an estimated project amount uh, that we are looking for partnership with the private sector for the development of Shire Hills. So it's not like we are requesting government, we are doing it together with private sector to develop Shire Hills right, so Resort. It is an area where we also invest well we can get money out of it and at the same time preserving our environment. So we'll not be cutting anything, we'll not be destroying, but we'll be getting money out of it. Just to illustrate, the recent uh, development has increased the number of visitors. It used to be around, uh, let's say, 1,000 people, but now we can boast of about 10 to 12,000 people annually going there. And that has increased our revenue from just some few cities to now over 200,000 Ghana cities. So it shows that if we're able to develop it, we'll stand a chance of increasing our revenue base. The concessionary investment, according to the executive director, will be on a long-term basis open to both local and international prospective investors. This investment, if ejected into the Shah Hills, is expected to see the Shah Hills cut out as a major ecotourist site opened to international business opportunities. This means that investment and private partnerships are bound to reap huge gains out of the project. Yes, we do what we call concession management. We we'll sign an agreement with the investor, depending upon the investment that we have made there are certain fixed charges that you will be paid to the, the Forestry Commission or the Ghana government. And then also the profit that will come, the, the you have to pay some portion to government. Definitely nobody goes to business and lose. And then in business we have what we call one plus one equals to three. Which shows that there's a hidden element which is the profit or what the businessman will get. So seriously, we also make provision that the businessman will get something out of it and it becomes a sustainable business because it's not a business that you go in for just three years and you think you reap your profit. No, you invest it as a long term. And I've seen a lot of concession agreements where even the owners will die and their family or children will succeed because it's a long term investment. So if you spread it over so many, it becomes a very secure form of investment that's what those who have money other people 
already going for this and uh, type of business with the change in the world's climate questions remain on how sustainable investments could be in the wake of extinct wildlife and endangered forests nana edunsia claims these changes in the climate are expected and that they cannot have a negative impact on this very lucrative venture every 35 to 40 years there's a change if you have been following the the whole environmental issues so therefore the environment will keep on changing and that is why god has given us that is one as as men that we should uh, supervise the uh, environment and perhaps we are lucky all these resources we are talking the wildlife the forest they are all renewable natural resources so if you put up a lot of uh, programs which will ensure bringing them back is possible if you go to some countries they are farming wildlife so there are more animals coming so that's another area we are trying to promote for people to start farming and breeding wildlife trees people can do tree planting they can even breed trees with different genetic uh, uh, structures because of what, this is what they want if they want uh, long or bow, bows of trees that are good for timber they can put some genetic modification to then increase the, the bows the bow sizes and length so it is a renewable natural resource that we are dealing with whereas wildlife forest fisheries they are all renewable natural so it's up to us not to be greedy and just take them without replacing if you have a very good plan of farming breeding uh, and then aquaculture we will bring all back some of this natural resource the advanced countries if you go to some countries like Germany, they have more wood than even we have in this country because they are planting. They have wood there. Okay. Yeah. The coming on board of investors together with the revamping of the Shire Hills will expand the tourist attraction base in Accra as business ventures and transactions hit a record high. BTA News, Charles Aite. The Ashanti Regional Officer of the Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG, has given a three-month ultimatum to all ministry departments and agencies and the Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies in the region to settle all their outstanding bills or risk being disconnected. The directive follows a recent government announcement that it will no longer bear the cost of power by the MDAs and the MMDAs. The government's directive was firmed up by the Ministry of Finance, circular to ECG and copied to the affected agency to be responsible for their bills with effect from January 2014. Political instability in some of Kenyan's key tea export markets is compelling players in the tea industry to look for means of diversifying their output in order to expand their, their global market share. In line with this, the Kenya Tea Development Agency introduced the production of orthodox teas in factory per zone in order to grow the value of exports. The Kenya Tea Development Agency has 65 factories affiliated to it throughout the country, existing in 12 zones. Orthodox teas fetch better prices and this explains the move to begin producing such. Already we have commissioned two factories, Mishimikuru and uh, another one in the uh, west of Lift Valley. They are already putting up machinery to start orthodox teas, but this will be increased to all the zones in the country. So what's the difference between orthodox teas and what Kenyan farmers normally produce? Orthodox teas is a a different way of manufacture. CTC is uh, cut, tear, and cull. Orthodox tea is a leaf tea. You roll it. The way you manufacture is a bit different from uh, the way we do it now. It's called leaf tea, and uh, the manufacture is rolling. So that uh, once you put into the teacup, it, the leaf opens. You know, the whole leaf opens. In Sri Lanka, for instance, 90% of tea production is orthodox teas. Some markets, Russia, Iran, 
most of Europe, like Germany and France, they drink orthodox teas. It is hoped that orthodox teas, once produced in higher volumes, will increase the value of Kenya's export earnings from tea and put a smile on farmers' faces. Alex Mwangi, NTV. The energy situation on the African continent continues to worsen. Businesses are suffering the brunt, having to bear with increasing cost of electricity. Nigeria's Transcorp chairman Tune Elumu shares his thoughts on how Africans' electricity supply is growing. He also talks about acquisition in Nigeria's energy sector and what needs to be done to attract investors to Africa. The last time Nigeria rebased its GDP was way back in 1990. But between then and now, a whole lot of new and large sectors have sprung up making the 1990 GDP figure non-reflective of the true state of the Nigerian economy. No one understands the situation better than economist Biodun Adedikwe, who is projecting a significantly higher figure than that of 1990. Looking at the level at which we had prices in 1990, which is the base year for the GDP at the present time, and then looking at where prices are today, so in my own estimation i would say i expect between 50 55 to 65 percent increase in the gdp that we have currently and that means it, that might put us at slightly above 400 you know billion u.s dollars that will effectively make nigeria the largest economy in the continent surpassing south africa analysts say that would attract more investment for africa's most populous country but there are concerns that the country's growth, which has consistently been in the region of 6.5% for about a decade now, could come under serious challenges. The bigger the economy, in the real sense of it, the more difficult it is to move at a very high speed. So in which case, if we, after we rebase, we should in fact, as policymakers, our policymakers, should look very closely at China. Because China is one big economy that has been able to perform, let me call it that miracle, of growing fast in spite of the size. On the streets of Nigeria, the euphoria that has greeted the rebasing in the business world is simply absent. Ask some Nigerians about it, and this is what you get. I don't know, I don't know. But as far as for the progress of the country, I think it's not a bad idea, it's a nice one. It's a good one. A lot of Nigerians, the average Nigerian on the street, don't care about the gross domestic products. What they care is what's in for them as in, in terms of exchange of food. The rebased GDP highlights the inherent contradiction in the Nigerian economy. Despite the country's consistent economic growth, basic infrastructure is still a big issue. With just about 2,500 megawatts of electricity for its 170 million people, power outage is a norm here. But the biggest headache for the country's government is unemployment, which is hovering around the 40% region. If investors will come into Nigeria, we should begin to look very closely at the number of jobs the investments will create, and not just in the quantum of investment, and not just in the fact that, yes, they brought in money, so we celebrate Nigeria as attracting the largest volume of foreign direct investment in Africa, which of course we have attained since 2009. Oil exports have plummeted 80% in the past eight months after the closures of oil ports led by militiamen seeking greater regional autonomy. Traders have been watching the negotiation closely, keen to know when Libya oil is going to re-enter the market after major disruption. The deal means the reopening of two out of four eastern oil ports after an eight-month blockade by armed groups. It had been costing billions of dollars in lost revenue, devastating Libya's economy. Now, after prolonged talks between the protest leaders and government intermediaries, there's a deal. The mediators have reached an agreement approved by the government to reopen the ports in two stages. Firstly, Zueitina and Hariga ports will reopen, while Raslanuf and Cedar ports are going to reopen in two to four weeks. Certainly, there will be other conditions and terms. The first signs of movement came less than a week ago with the release of three men who had stolen the Morning Glory oil tanker with up to $30 million worth of crude on board. 
The men had been detained by U.S. Navy SEALs, who raided the tanker, then handed the men over to the Libyan government. The men's leader received a hero's welcome from the armed group that had been the main force behind the blockade. Its head, Ibrahim Jadran, was behind all the demands for autonomy and a larger share of the oil revenue for the eastern region. But it's believed there is dissent among some armed groups about making a deal with the government. And it all happened on a day when the eastern city of Benghazi was expressing anger at the way its leaders are running the country. Strikes were held in the public and private sectors, shutting down schools and the university. Approach roads to Benghazi's airport were blocked and staff stopped work in the main terminal. All international flights in and out of the airport were cancelled on Sunday. The protesters are demanding that the General National Congress based here in Tripoli should be disbanded immediately. They say that infighting amongst parliamentarians has been a major factor in the breakdown of law and order, any semblance of it throughout the country, particularly in the east. While there may be optimism with some of the oil due to start flowing again soon, a combination of anger, depression and frustration among Libyans is bearing down heavily on this weak government. Andrew Simmons, Al Jazeera, Tripoli. That's all for business stories on Business Television Africa. But before we go, let's take a quick look at our top stories. Ghana Maritime Authority has opened a three-day seminar in Accra to raise awareness on safety of navigation systems and vessel systems. Wildlife Division of Forestry Commission of Ghana is seeking to raise $10 million in concessionary investment to uplift the image of Shy Hill Reserve Center as a tourist destination. Chairman of Nigeria's Trust Corp, Tony Ilumo, shares his thoughts on acquisition in Nigeria's energy sector and what needs to be done to attract investors to Africa. Two oil terminals have reopened after rebels agreed partially to lift their oil blockade in a deal reached with government. Thank you for watching. My name is Anna Maria Nyame.